What's my ETA? I guess that's a question that everyone asks every single day. How many of us have asked that question before leaving for the event today? I know. <laughs> yeah. And, and this is not just an important question at Uber. It's actually a billion dollar yen, rupee, currency <laughs> question. And maybe even um, Bitcoin at some time, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to speak a little bit about it. I'm Srita Goripati. I'm a data scientist in the MAPS team. I focus on routing and ETAs. And my team thinks that I'm the ideal person to work for this because my name ends with an ETA. So <laughs> I guess I'm the authority for this. A little bit about me. Um, I did my undergrad in IIT Bombay in India, and I did my MS and PhD at UC Berkeley, just right around the corner. And I, did, uh, I was focusing on transportation engineering, so really similar things like here. And I've spent the past very exciting nine months at Uber focusing on routing and ETAs and trying to answer this question, how can we improve ETAs and user experience? I will first spend some time on breaking down the question, what is an ETA? ETA is estimated time to arrival. It's basically the time taken to go from point A to point B. And the second question is, why is it really a billion dollar or currency question across the world? For this, I'm going to refer to a study done by Ubernomics, which showed that bad ETA is a key signal of bad experience to a rider. What is a bad ETA? Bad ETA is when the predicted ETA is really off from the actual travel time. And I'm going to use the word ETA a lot for travel time, so bear with me on the, on the cool short forms. Um, so yeah, so what they did was they picked the top three percentile of user of trips with bad ETAs, and then they found similar trips with a good ETA, with the same origin, same destination, same neighborhood, etc. And then they tried to follow the, the, beha the right-taking behavior of the users with bad ETAs and the right-taking behavior of users with good ETAs. And this plot basically shows on the x-axis the percentage loss due to a bad ETA ride. And you see two clusters. One is the total spending and number of rides. And the way to read this plot is a higher bar means that a bad ETA has a really high impact. And a lower bar is it doesn't matter. And what we see is across different cities like Boston, Chicago, and Dallas, UberX and UberPool, bad ETA was really, really bad for users' experience and their, their further interaction with Uber in terms of number of rides and the amount that they spend. And what the TLDR of this study was bad experience from ETA actually accounts to millions of dollars of loss in just these three cities in 90 days. And when you scale that number and you think about the operations that we're at, at, which is 600 plus cities, 77 countries and 5 billion plus rides, that number really hits the billion dollar mark really, really fast. So this is the value of a good ETA. And we're really trying to make sure that we're providing the most value to consumers. ETAs are a very key decision variable in engineering, data science and uh, business operations. And they're used across multiple teams, starting from dispatch. This is the team that basically tries to find the best car to pick you up. And then Uber pool, fares, navigation, Uber eats and pick up team. All the names are kind of, um, uh, they explain what they do. So I'm not going to spend time on that. And then how do ETs interact with, with us who take the trips, who use Uber as an app? Let's take a trip and look at that. We first open the app, type our destination. We see an eyeball ETA, which is the two minutes uh, black um, square we see. And then we see a fare and we see a time to destination. All these three numbers are powered by ETAs. And then we see the dispatch screen where you see a bouncing ball where the dispatch team is trying to find the best car to pick you up. And here again, we use ETAs to find the best possible car to pick you up to minimize your waiting time and travel time. And then we see the pickup screen where we see which car is assigned to you and what's the pickup route, which is the gray line, and what's the time taken to pick you up. And this, again, is powered by ETAs. And finally, we're in the car on the trip, and we constantly see a time to destination that is, again, powered by ETAs. So ETAs are actually interacting with users at every single stage of their trip taking experience and really impacts how they, how they experience and enjoy a ride. And not just that, one trip is actually thousands of ETA requests that we're constantly making at every single phase of the trip from eyeball to on trip. And I want to spend a little bit of time just thinking about what the mission of Uber is and how does it really tie into our discussions with ETAs. Uber wants to bring reliable transportation 
to everyone everywhere. And how does that really relate to predicting ETAs? Well, I want to focus on two words here. One is reliable and one is everywhere. And reliability can come in when the ETA that we predict is actually equal to the ETA that the user experiences. And everywhere, because Uber operates everywhere. And we want to actually bring this reliability to every single part of the, of the globe that we predict in. We can start this process by using map data. So we can use simple heuristics on the map data, like um, we can use Haversine distance or as the crow flies distance between two points and use some scalars for speed and predict the ETA. Will that work? Will that be reasonable? Not really. There's going to be a big error from the actual, AT, actual ETA because we as human beings don't walk through walls very often. <laughs> Sometimes I do when I wake up. But uh, we, have, we have a complex street network. We have highways. There's a really specific pattern of routes that we take that is not represented by a straight line. So how do we solve this? We then think about layers like routing, traffic, and machine learning to really bridge this gap between what we predict as our ETAs and what the actual ETA is. And so in the rest of the talk, I'm going to spend time talking about these systems that we have in place to really predict good ETAs at Uber. I'll focus, I'll start with routing. Um, I'll, I'll speak a little bit about routing algorithms and uh, especially serving the large scale, low latency serving purposes at Uber. What's the problem statement in routing? We need to find the best possible route and an ETA given an origin and given a destination on a road network. And that has two components. The first component is to find the best possible route or the shortest route, which is a function of the time and distance of the route. And the second is given you have a route, how do you find the best possible ETA, the most accurate ETA? And in this plot, the, the three minutes is the ETA and the gray line is the route. The first thing we have to do for estimating a route is really represent your physical map into a graph representation to facilitate route computation. In this, every intersection is, um, every intersection is modeled by a node, and every road segment is modeled by a directed edge. And as soon as you think of routing and shortest path, Dijkstra's comes to our mind. And I can honestly spend an entire conference just talking about Dijkstra's and how like it's amazing and impressive, but I'm, because I have only a little bit of time, I'll focus on using Dijkstra's in the routing context at Uber. And I quickly want to remind everyone that Dijkstra's complexity, which is the amount of time it takes to find a route is N log N, where N is the number of intersections, uh, number of nodes or intersections in the graph network. I want to focus on the number n log n a little bit and just give a sense of will this work? Will Dijkstra's really work for routing at Uber? So n for just San Francisco Bay Area is half a million, half a million intersections. And n log n is a big number. And if we really have algorithms that work at this scale and you're opening an app, you can wait till you know, afternoon <laughs> or for the next day, schedule your ride for the next day. It's not going to work. And, if the, and especially if you think of the physical scale of the world that we operate in, it's just not going to work. And then once the physical scale really sets in, then you have the serving scale, which is we actually, the routing engine at Uber serves 500,000 requests per second, which is 20 billion requests in 48 hours. And we deal with hundreds and thousands of GP points in 48 in, in per second. And I mean, I've been here for nine months, but that's a big number. Like, that's like dealing with something of this sort and developing efficient algorithms is, is a difficult work. And that's something we really enjoy doing here. So obviously, Dijkstra's is not going to work. How can we improvise that and really, so, and really uh, still cater to the scale? So that's where the paradigm of partitioning comes in. Instead of thinking of solving this big problem of the entire graph, can we think about solving a, single, a small partition of the, of the graph and simplify the problem? And maybe we can, we can be one step smarter and pre-compute the best path within, inside the graph and just interact with the boundaries of the graph of the single small partition. And will that work? Will that make things better? And I want to give a little bit of intuition to why that might work better. Think of a dense graph network as a surface. So you have a surface like a circle that is started with nodes, with intersections, and that's a continuous surface. 
And if you have to find the best possible route in that particular partition, you'll have to traverse every single node, figure out what's the best path, and then find the best possible path. But if you pre-compute that beforehand, you already know what the best path is inside the circle. You just have to interact with the nodes at the circle. So think of your, of your complexity of search going from R squared, which is the area of your circle, to R, which is the perimeter of your circle. So you're reducing the complexity from N to square root of N. And you're reducing that for every single partition from N to square root of N. And, and, and why is this better? If you think of, again, the San Francisco uh, example, half a million can now become 700. And that's a number we can deal with. So partitioning really helps us scale and provide efficient and accurate, uh, accurate uh, routing solutions. So now that we have um, a, route, a, a reasonable route routing algorithm, how can we then find the best possible route? That's where the traffic on these segments become really important. How can we find which route should we take given the traffic, given the travel time to, that each segment has? And, um, and then once we have the route, how do we estimate the travel time? You need to, again, understand how much time it takes to traverse each segment. So that's where traffic comes in. And I will spend the next few slides just talking about traffic modeling and traffic in routing algorithms. The vision of traffic is to know the state of traffic for every single road. And traffic is a function of the traversal information on road segments. And traversal information, traversal behavior is a function of weather, time of the day, real life events, et cetera. And just a rule of thumb in traffic is more traversals on the roads is more accurate traffic information. So let's look at this road segment, which is 11th Street between Market and Mission. We collect GPS data on this road segment. Um, and we use this GPS data to find the real time speed on this, on this particular segment. So for simplicity, let's just look at point A and point B in red color. And we find the length of the segment point of the segment AB, and we find the timestamps of segment A uh, of point A and point B, and we take the difference between those two. So that's the time taken to traverse that segment. And we find the speed, the real time speed of segment AB is just distance over time, AB by T, T A minus T B. And we do this for every single road segment in real time as cars are moving on the road. And again, to give a scale of the size of this problem, one day of GPS data is about half a terabyte. And one week's traffic models are a few terabytes. So again, routing is a very, very intensive process. And then we have traffic on top, which is even more intensive. And once we have traffic data for every segment, we use this traffic information to populate the edge weights on the graph for the best path, the best route computation. As an example, I've shown here on this particular path, we found a route, the best possible route, in which a few segments have high traffic, some have medium traffic, and some have low traffic in three different colors. And there are some questions that are worth exploring in traffic that, um, that can really influence the quality of our traffic estimation. One of the questions is how long should a real-time traffic estimate that we find on a segment be valid? If it's too long, then it's going to be stale and not representing the world. If it's too short, then we haven't exploited the information from that traffic, uh, traffic feed. So really understanding when to draw that line is one of the questions that we're still trying to understand better. And another question is, how do we combine historical speeds, which is aggregated data over a long period of time, with real-time speed information? And why is this an important question? Uh, one way to think about this is the bias variance trade-off. If you focus a lot on real-time traffic, you're, you're having lesser bias, but more variance. But if you focus on historical speeds, which is the more long-term aggregated data, you have lesser variance, but more bias from your existing situation. So finding the right balance between this is a very interesting problem that we're trying to understand here. And then once we have routing, we have the traffic layer on top, how can we further improve and provide accurate ETAs? And that's what we'll be focusing on the machine learning section here. So, so far, so far, we have the map data, we have routing and traffic to find the best possible route and ETAs. Um, are we good? Um, let's, let's, let's try it out. Let's see how we can route using this stack. So we, we route from airport to downtown San Francisco. Looks like a good route. Looks like a good, good ETA. I guess we're done. We can probably add our backs. Let's take a look in for a trip in Hyderabad. This is my hometown. And uh, I guess 
if teleportation is not invented, that does not look feasible. So we have a lot of work to do. And that's, again, tying to Nancy's point that really, like, can we provide solutions that are not valid for just HQ, but everywhere around the world as we operate, as we go global? And that's just an example. If you really dig down into data, you see that this trend is true across the entire country. So if you compare the ETA error, which is the predicted ETA minus the actual ETA, and you plot the distribution um, for India versus North America, you see this trend. So the green curve, the green high peaked curve is the PDF for North America. PDF is probably distribution function. It's a, it's a measure of how probable or how often will you see this value. And on the x-axis, you have the ETA error. So higher is bad, lower is good. And a higher peak at a lower value is good because you're saying you have very small ETA errors. And a higher tail, which means you have more high ETA errors, is bad. So here in this curve, we see that the green curve has a higher peak, lower tails for North America. And the blue curve has higher tails and a shorter peak near small ETA errors. So it has really high ETA errors. So this is a trend that we see across all the trips. So there's a systematic uh, bias or inefficiency that we see here. And this is where machine learning can actually be very useful in capturing this variability in region, time, trip, drive, driver behavior. And this can help us predict realistic ETAs and bridge that gap between our predictions and the actual ETA. One of the important questions in machine learning is model selection. And I'll focus on two aspects of machine learning. Uh, of model selection here. One is linearity. What is linear? An example of linear interaction between two variables is if you increase variable A, let's say by 10%, variable B will increase by a scale, a proportion of 10%. This interaction is called linear. And when that's not true, it's nonlinear. An example of a nonlinear interaction is between ETAs and hour of the day. As we're all aware, there are very few specific pockets of hours called peak hours where the ETAs are just proportionally high. And just hours around it, we see that the ETA is not that high. So obviously, as you increase the hour of the day, you do not see an increase in the ETA. There's like a very specific nonlinear relationship. And that's, that's one of the ex examples. And the second important aspect is parametric. What does parametric mean? Uh, now that we've discovered that ETA and hour of the day have a nonlinear relationship, um, the next question is, do we know how they interact with each other? We don't. And we're hoping that the model that we build really understands that and, predict, and uses its information to predict ETAs. So models where we do not really understand the interaction between variables, and we are hoping that the model discovers them, these kind of models are called non-parametric models. And at Uber, because we have these really complex interactions between ETA and a lot of... Um, the real world events like traffic, road networks, hour of the day, human behavior. We really uh, want to focus on models that are lying in the orange region, which is non-parametric and non-linear. There are some advantages of linear and parametric models that they're very simple and fast to compute, but the gains we get in accuracy are significantly higher for the orange section. And you can, we can, we are, we're learning a bunch of these models that I've listed here, trying to explore what works best for predicting ETAs on our routing and traffic layer. And finally, with great modeling power comes great reliability responsibility. Yay. <laughs> uh, so we are really, really working hard to make sure that we have strong fallback ETA systems to avoid system down situations. A case in which our team fails to provide ETAs and routes to the downstream teams I was talking about will lead to, will lead to a no car situation. And that's something we definitely don't want to happen. So we're making sure that we always have something to fall back on. And we also have to very importantly monitor ETAs to obviate customer issues, both internal and external, and make everyone's ride magical. <laughs>